in research on the happiest people in the world. Marty Seligman and Ed Dinner found that the number one determinant of their happiness was a rich and healthy social life. In other research on national levels of happiness, it was found that the number one determinant of the happiest countries in the world was rich and healthy social life. Relationships make a difference. What I'm going to focus on in this lecture is the ultimate relationship, romantic relationships. However, what I'm going to talk about applies to all relationships, because very often if you study the extremes, you can tell a lot about the middle. So let's look at romantic relationships. Let's talk about love and begin with the state of affairs. And the state of affairs, not so great. What we see when it comes to long-term relationships, to marriages, is that there are very high divorce rates. In fact, in the United States, between 40 to 50 percent of marriages end up in divorce. The rest of the world, not far behind. The thing, though, is that even those 50 to 60 percent who do stay together, it's not always great. There are a lot of relationships where there are illicit affairs, where there is infidelity. So this woman walks into her hypnotherapist's office, and she's all distressed, and she says to her hypnotherapist, she says, doctor, help me. You know, for 15 years, I'd been married to my husband, and there was trust between us, and it was a great relationship, amazing. And then yesterday, I broke that trust. Please, please, make this memory go away. Help me, I can't live with the guilt. The hypnotherapist looks at her, shakes his head, and says, oh, not again. <laughs> but even those who are not unfaithful to the partners, even there, very often, the passion disappears. So these two guys are playing golf. They're hitting the ball, walking around the golf course, and suddenly a funeral procession goes by the hole where they were playing. And one of the guys stands still, takes off his cap, puts his on his heart, and bows down. And the other guy says to him, wow, this is the most thoughtful, generous, and kind gesture I've ever seen. It's amazing. To which the guy responds, well, we have been married for 35 years. <laughs> so very often, our passions move. <laughs> Our passions move from the relationship. Now, when couples get together and say, I do, they always get together with the intention, this is going to work till death do us part. But that doesn't often last. So even relationships where they're together, the love is not there. And there is a lot of unhappiness that is taking place in those relationships, those relationships that promised so much at the beginning. What do we do about that? What does this mean? Does it perhaps mean that we're just not made for long-term relationships? And there are many people who, who think that or live that way. I don't think that's the case. And there's a lot of research that shows that there are numerous benefits to being together and staying together. And I want to start this conversation by drawing on some research. This research was conducted by one of the leading academic journals in the world, asking one of the most important questions in the world. The leading academic journal is People's Magazine. <laughs> the question that it asked was, who is the sexiest man alive? <laughs> and the answer is, for this year, Chris Hemsworth. You know, I don't know what they find in him. I mean, really. But anyway, he was chosen, and I'll, you know, I'll, it's research. I'm not going to argue with that. But that's not all. There's another leading academic journal that asked an even more profound, deep question. The academic journal is GQ. <laughs> and the question that it asked, taking People's Magazine a step further, the question that is, it asked was, who is the sexiest woman of the 21st century? 
Now, they ran very sophisticated regression statistics to understand who it would be for the rest of the century, and they found her. And the winner is Beyonce. Now, uh, can you stop looking, please? Can you look at me? Hello, I have important things to say. Guys, all right, thank you. I have no choice. We have to continue. <laughs> okay, so this research captures the, the imagination, the fantasy of people all around the world. So let's continue to fantasize and imagine. Imagine this. Imagine that you meet your superhero or rock star. You meet them, and when you meet them, you realize something else about them. Not only are they hot and sexy, they are also sensitive, incredibly smart, generous, kind, interesting, engaging. Not only that, they are crazily, madly, head over heels in love with you. You get together, and not only that, in bed, compatibility, 110%. Never been anything like, it's, it's just almost too, it's almost like a fairy tale, but it's the truth. It's your reality, imagine that. And you get together and you live happily and lustily ever after. But now five years go by. Five years, not a long time, go by. You're married and you're happy together. And then there is real research by a real academic journal conducted on you, the Journal of Positive Psychology. And the researcher comes to you and says, what I'm interested in is measuring levels of arousal. So he connects all these uh, electrodes and galvanic skin response and all that stuff to you and measures your levels of arousal. And you're sitting tied to all these electrodes and you're beautiful, gorgeous, sexy, smart, intelligent lover, husband, wife, walk in. And then they measure your levels of arousal. And they are dressed very nicely in a sexy attire and then they leave. And then a second person comes in, who is you know, quite good looking, also you know, nicely dressed, and they measure your levels of arousal when that person comes in. And the question is, the question is, when are your levels of arousal higher? For person number one, the love of your life, your perfect partner, or person number two who you've just met who's is okay? Person number two, inevitable. This is the truth, the reality about relationships. You see, because it's novelty, it's the new that produces heightened levels of arousal. Because we're change detectors, we get used to things that are there. But when there is something new, we're aroused. It's new, it's novel, it's more interesting and exciting. Even if the old has all the characteristics of perfection. Daryl Bem from Cornell University talks about the exotic becoming erotic. There's a story about Kelvin Coolidge, who was president of the United States in the 1920s. So Kelvin Coolidge and his wife, Grace, go to a chicken farm. And they walk around the chicken farm, and they see the farmer. They see the rooster, and they see the hens there. And, and um, the farmer tells uh, Grace Coolidge, he says, you know, the um, rooster mates 12 times a day. She says, wow, 12 times a day. Why don't you tell that to Mr. Coolidge? <laughs> now, Mr. Coolidge overhears their conversation, and he calls the farmer over, and he says, excuse me, sir, uh, does he mate with the same hen uh, 12 times? <laughs> And he says, um, no, with 12 different hens. <laughs> okay, tell that to Mrs. Coolidge. <laughs> the exotic becomes erotic. So what do we do about that? Does that mean that we're just not meant to be in monogamous relationships? Well, not so. Because there are examples, there are examples, not the majority, unfortunately, but there are examples where love and passion do grow over time, where couples who have been together for 10 years or 30 years still enjoy not just great love and companionship, but also lust and passion.
And in fact, the relationship, whether it's their love or their sex life, is better after decades together. Now, once there are exceptions like this, the question is no longer whether or not it's possible, but rather how is it possible? What do we need to do in order to enjoy this kind of relationship with our partner of three years or 23 years? And there are some answers that psychology can provide us. You see, researchers like John Gottman, whom we'll meet in a few minutes, and David Chenarch, show that couples who are in their 50s and who have been together for a long time actually are more likely to peak sexually than young couples. It's not that sex can't be great at 18, but it can even be better at 58. Over time, the relationship becomes better and better, which leads more and more psychologists to negate the claim that you know, men peak at, what, 24, and, and women at 35. Maybe physiologically, they do, but in terms of their potential, it's very far from it, which led David Chenarch to say, cellulite and sexual potential are highly correlated. <laughs> in other words, as we grow older, we have more potential, with the emphasis on potential, to have a better love life. The thing, though, it's potential, and this potential is not realized by most couples. And the question is, how can we help to realize, to make it real? So I want to talk about a few things that psychologists teach us, that we can learn, that you can apply today or tonight, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so the first thing is the importance of hard work. There is a lot of misunderstanding about what makes for great relationship. And the misunderstanding largely revolves around the distinction between finding that partner, the Thor or the mov movie star, our perfect partner, versus the importance of cultivating our chosen relationship. You see, most people believe, whether explicitly or implicitly, whether consciously or subconsciously, is that, the, is that the most important thing in enjoying love for the rest of our life is finding that right partner. In fact, what the research shows, what the experience of successful relationships shows, is that much more important than finding that right person is cultivating, focusing, investing in our relationship. Now, the misunderstanding about the importance of finding the right person comes largely from movies. Why? Because what do we see in the movies? In the movies, we see people going through hardships, trials and tribulations, difficulties, challenges. And then, toward the end, they come closer together. After fighting and disagreeing, and not even liking each other in many cases, at the end, they come together they kiss, and they live happily ever after. And this is the model that is very deeply ingrained in our subconscious. This is how we lead our lives. We need to find that right person. May not be easy, trials and tribulations, difficulties, but once we find them, we can live happily ever after. The problem with this model, the problem with movies, is that movies end where love begins. It is after the movie ends that the real work of love begins. It's the living happily ever after that poses the greatest challenge. Now, a great challenge doesn't have to be painful. It can be a pleasurable and enjoyable challenge, but a challenge nevertheless. In other words, what we need after the screen goes down, after the wedding is over, after the honeymoon, is over, that's when we need to start putting in the real work. Much more work because it's much more important than just finding that right person. And it's not that values are not important, of course. Values are important. Of course, being attracted to the person is important. I had a colleague at Harvard who used to say, if your attraction to the person is a seven, you can build on that. Good enough. It doesn't have to be Thor or Beyonce, you can work on that, build on that, but you have to work because effort is necessary. I mean, imagine this, imagine this scenario. So for years, you have been looking for your dream job. You've been looking all over the world 
for the work that is just perfect for you, just what you want to do with the rest of your life. And then you come to work on the first day. You come into your corner office, just the work that you have wanted your whole life. There is a sofa in your office. You lie down on the sofa, and you say to yourself, I found it. I got it. I found my perfect work. Mwah, perfect work. I love you so much. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. And you sit there just being really happy about finding your perfect job for a day and a week. And what happens? You won't last a week, probably. You'll be fired. You'll be out. Because what happens after you find your perfect job? That's when you really start working. That's when you put in the hours. Because you love it, because you care about it, because it's important and meaningful for you. And yet when it comes to relationships, why do we have this distorted false model? Oh, I found her. I found him. Now we can live happily ever after on the sofa. That doesn't work. Should it surprise us that it doesn't work? And yet that's how most people live their lives. Effort is necessary. The hard work begins after the screen drops, after we get home from the wedding, from the honeymoon. And it can be wonderful. I mean, it's your favorite job. It's the woman of your choice, the man of your choice. Why not invest in it and help the relationships grow and grow over time? So what does that hard work look like? So the first thing is to continue to do things together. You know, my wife, Tommy, always says that people fall out of love not because they spend too much time together, but because they spend too little time together. And she's right. You know, in fact, she's always right. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, do, you know, do you know this book, um, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus? So, I don't know if you've heard, but there's a sequel to it. Women Are From Venus, Men Are Wrong. <laughs> just, just came out. So... But, you know, she's right, and, 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 but it's not just doing things together, it's doing new things together. So there's, there was research done by Arthur Aaron, who took you know, couples who've been together for a while, divided them randomly into three groups. One group, nothing new. Second group, they had the task of spending more time together. So they did what they've always done. So they spend more time talking or more time going to the usual places that they went to, spend more time together. Third group, explicit instructions, spend more time together doing new things, different things, things that you haven't done before. It was the third group that enjoyed a significant rise in their overall levels of well-being because remember, Novelty produces heightened levels of arousal. The exotic is erotic. When you introduce new things into the relationship, good things happen. And we live in a very um, multifaceted, rich, interesting world. There are always new things that we can do, different things that we can introduce into our relationships. So for example, go to museums together, go on vacations together to places you haven't been before. Go to a course on Tantra or try different things in bed. Read books together. Talk about new ideas. Excite the mind. Go to concerts. Try things. Do new things. Constantly surprise your partner. Allow yourself to be surprised, to introduce more novelty, to introduce more of the exotic. It doesn't have to be extreme or radical. It's the small things done regularly that make a big difference. In addition, work on your positivity ratio, your five to one positivity ratio. This is taken from wonderful work done by John Gottman, one of the leading scholars in the area of relationships. And what he talks about when he studied relationships was that the best relationships enjoy, on average, a five to one positivity ratio. So for example, for every one painful, negative experience, such as a, a conflict, a fight, a, a, a disagreement, uh, something unpleasant. These couples experience five positive experiences. That's more or less the ratio, five to one. Now, 
measuring exactly five to one, you know, I wouldn't go around with a scale in a relationship here. Now we're six to one, let's have a fight. Or now we're three to one, let's, you know, let's do something positive. There are two key messages from this research. The first key, very important message is that some negativity, some conflict is important. Why? Because there, are, there is no perfect relationship, certainly not after the honeymoon phase. And in every relationship, there are difficulties and hardships. Now, if you don't experience hardships and difficulties, if everything is smooth sailing, I'm talking about post-honeymoon phase, then it means that we're sweeping things under the rug. That means that we're inauthentic, and that cannot lead to the long-term success of a relationship. So some negativity is important. Second, the second message here is that we need more positivity than negativity. So introduce more positivity into your relationship. You know, write them a text, buy him flowers, introduce positive activities, and if they can be new activities, it's two for the price of one. And over time, the positivity ratio will go up, and over time, the relationship over time will improve. The third thing that I want to talk about in improving relationships, especially long-term relationships, is being known rather than being validated. You see, if you look at most of the studies and discussion about long-term relationship, the emphasis is on being validated. You need to validate your partner. You want to be validated by your partner. And while it feels very good to be validated and to validate, it doesn't lead to long-term happiness. It doesn't lead to long-term intimacy and closeness. What is more important for the long-term success, thriving of the relationship, is to know and to be known. To know and to be naked physically as well as psychologically. Now, what does this mean? What it means is that self-disclosure is more important than self-presentation. It's more important to open up, to be real, to express rather than impress. So yes, when I go on a first date, I want to impress and it's natural and it's fine, but over time, what I want to do first and foremost is to open up, to express myself, to be known and to get to know my partner. That means to talk about my fears, to talk about my fantasies, whether sexual fantasies or life fantasies, to be open about what I care about most, to be open about my strengths as well as my weaknesses. Now, your partner may not always like what they hear, what you say. They may not connect to it, but it's fine. It's okay. Because if you hide those things that are real about you, your partner may like that version of you, but it's not the real you. But not only that, you're also significantly, not a little, but significantly enhancing the likelihood that your relationship will thrive over time. When there is this level of openness. And again, even if they don't always like what you say, even if you don't always like what they say, as level of openness increases, so does the relationship improve. Why? Because what it does is it leads to intimacy. And intimacy is the key to long-term passion. This is the distinguishing characteristic between those few who enjoy lustier, happier relationships after 30 years than they did at the beginning, and most people who do not. They open up, they self-disclose, they share, they know and are known, they become intimate. And it's not always easy, but in the long term, it contributes to much happiness and love. And by the way, this doesn't just apply to intimate relationships. This idea of being known rather than being validated can transform any relationship, from relationships with your friends to relationships with your colleagues, with your students and teachers. You know, I know as a teacher, it has literally changed the way I present because I used to go on stage and my main objective was, how can I be validated? A lot of pressure thinking about that. Whereas now, and I have it on my lecture notes, I remind myself, be known. Express what you care about most in this lecture. It's not that validation is not important. Of course, it feels good. But the more important thing 
is expressing rather than impressing, being authentic, being real, being known. In the words of David Schnarch, intimacy is about letting yourself really be known, including parts that you or your partner don't like. But it's not just about letting warts be known. It often involves showing strength you've been hiding too. Most approaches focus on getting your partner's validation and acceptance when you disclose. But you can't count on this, and if you try, it inherently limits self-disclosure, because you won't say things your partner won't validate. Resolving gridlock requires intimacy based on validating yourself. When David Schnarch talks about gridlock, he's talking about these real conflicts, not the conflicts where you know, we, we fight and then we make up and you know, everything's fine again. These are conflicts that are deep, that are real, that seem to be irresolvable. Usually gridlock is around one of four topics, usually, not always, but around one of four topics, sometimes all four. First topic, children, children's education, children's nutrition. Second topic, about the expanded family, the in-laws. How many times do we go visit them or do we visit them at all? Third topic is around money. What do we spend our money on? When do we save? And the fourth area of conflict, usually, is around sex. How often, what kind of sex? Now, when couples reach a gridlock, again, not a conflict, a gridlock, they're stuck, literally stuck. They cannot see a way out. Now, the interesting thing is that it usually happens, the first gridlock, around after four years. And then they're recurring gridlocks. Now, what happens when there is a gr gridlock? A few things can happen. The first thing that can happen is that the couples divorce or break up. That very often happens, which is why we see a huge spike in divorce levels between year four and year seven. This is where the gridlock happens. I can't see a way out. I thought this was my superhero, my Wonder Woman, but it's not. They fall apart. Then there's a second group who stay together, but they're no longer really together. So yeah, they live together, they cohabitate, they go through the motion, but it's not what it used to be. But they don't split up because of uh, social norms or because of the kids or for financial reasons, whatever. They're together, but they're not really together. Group number two. Group number three, they go through the gridlock. They fight and they disagree. They open up. They reveal themselves, what they're really about, why they want what they want, why it's so important who they are really. They go through the storm and ultimately, almost inevitably, they emerge from the storm and they emerge a lot stronger from it. But only if they're prepared to go through their hardships, through their hard work and put in the effort that it takes to resolve those serious gridlocks. And two things happen when they resolve those gridlocks. The relationship improves. They become a lot more intimate and therefore more passionate. But there's something else that happens. They grow up. They themselves become more mature. In fact, David Schnarch talks about marriage as a people's growing machine, arguing that it's the best way to grow as an individual, as an independent being, and part of an interdependent relationship. I would like to end by reading an excerpt from a poem by E. E. Cummings called, I Carry Your Heart With Me. Here is the deepest secret nobody knows. Here is the root of the root and the bud of the bud and the sky of the sky of a tree called life, which grows higher than soul can hope or mind can hide. And this is the wonder that's keeping the stars apart. Well, today, with the advent of the science of happiness, we have a better understanding of this secret, of this wonder that keeps the stars apart. And with this understanding, with this knowledge, we can help bring people, lovers, friends, and colleagues closer together. Thank you.